Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. As we do every Thursday, we jump into the time machine for Throwback Thursday. And since Tuesday would have been Gordy Howe's 92nd birthday, let's revisit a conversation I had with Jerry Truppiano, the voice of the Houston Arrows, when Gordy made an unforgettable stop right here in Houston back in the 70s. Unbelievably, he came out of retirement in his mid-40s and scored over 100 points twice in four years in what was then the renegade World Hockey Association. It was the one and only time Houston had high-level hockey. I caught up with Truppiano after Gordy's passing four years ago to reminisce about Mr. Hockey's stint here, not to mention a little extra on the Arrows franchise and a bonus story about Calvin Murphy with the Rockets. Right before the Truppiano interview, you'll hear a little bit of a Gordy Howe tribute that Sportsnet did following his passing. So let's jump in the time machine to remember Mr. Hockey and his days in H-Town. Representing all of hockey with great distinction for five decades, number nine. If you're going to make a protocol hockey player, who would you pick? You'd pick Gordy Howe. Well, you can see why Gordy Howe is uh, said to be the greatest player in the history of the National Hockey League. But the best all-around player that can play any position and probably go to goal is Gordy Howe. And Gordy Howe, they call him Mr. Hockey. Gordy Howe was hockey. The great sport of hockey, honor Mr. Hockey, Gordy Howe. Jerry. What are your memories of Gordie Howe and, and covering him over those few years that uh, you covered him with the Arrows? I remember I was five years old at the time. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, it, it was a, a pleasure and a privilege uh, to cover Gordie. It was a distinct pleasure and an honor to call him my friend. Just a, a great athlete who was a great individual as well, and that is a, a dynamic combination. What do you remember about him? Because a lot of people think that not only was he the greatest player in hockey, but he's probably known as one of the nicest guys as well. He was really uh, unique in that he didn't have the hardest shot. He didn't have the speed uh, as far as skating ability. He, he wasn't a Bobby Orr as far as speed. He wasn't a Bobby Hall with the shot. But he was the predecessor to, to Wayne Gretzky for anticipation on the ice, he had the ability to see things and, and create things. He, he was as tough as anybody on the ice. He was not like some of the players. We all know there's fighting in hockey, and he would fight his own battles. He didn't have to have a, you know, a, a big tough guy to protect the uh, superstars on your team. Uh, he was the superstar on the Red Wings, and, and he took care of his own business. He was Mr. Hockey. I guess that's the best way to say it. And and. In this day and age, when we, you know, we, we talk about athletes, we talk about LeBron, and in the past we've talked about Michael, and we've talked about Magic and, and Larry. There was Gordy. You, in hockey, would refer to Gordy, and everybody knew you were talking about Gordy Howe. There was a three-year span, I believe, that he averaged 100 points per season with the Arrows. I know it was the WHA, it wasn't the NHL. What's the equivalent of that, you know, to be able to do that at age 46, 47, 48 years old? Is there anything that you've seen in sports? Maybe Nolan Ryan, I don't know. Maybe Nolan Ryan, that's about, that's about it. Uh, you, you don't see players participating actively at the highest level of a sport in their mid-40s. You know, Tom Brady uh, for the Patriots says he wants to play uh, until uh, his, his late 40s. Having watched him for a number of years, I wouldn't bet against him. But it is certainly a, a unique situation. I guess the only two that, that come to mind would be Gordie Howe and, and Nolan Ryan. Uh, Gordy played with the Arrows for that short amount of time. But at that time, Jerry, remind everybody, because a lot of people obviously don't remember this, that the Arrows were at some points, I guess, out uh, drawing the Houston Rockets. The Rockets had just got to Houston at that point. The Oilers were having some bad seasons. So the Arrows were a little bit of the talk of the town at that point, right? Yes, they, they were. They were out drawing the uh, Rockets at that time. They were instrumental in getting the summit built 
They started out in the old Sam Houston Coliseum with chicken wire instead of plexiglass above the boards. But eventually got, they got the plexiglass at, at the Coliseum and then, of course, moved into the uh, uh, summit. The arrows were, were very popular. And, you know, at one point there was the failed merger, the first failed merger between the WHA and the NHL. And then there was the ticket drive that uh, saw the uh, ownership at the time of the uh, Arrows trying to get into the National Hockey League if they sold a certain number of tickets, and they did. And, of course, that, that bid failed. But by that time, the Howes, Gordy, and his two sons, Mark and Marty, had moved on to uh, the Hartford Whalers. But, but there would have been no dream of even trying to get into the NHL at that time without the arrival of, of Gordy Howe and his two sons. There were a couple of things, and tell me if I get this wrong, that really drew Gordy to Houston. One of them was... They signed him for a million dollars over four years. That was two hundred and fifty thousand a year, which the average NHL salary at the time was twenty five thousand dollars a year. And the other thing is they signed his two sons, Mark and Marty, who you've mentioned. So he got to play with his teenage sons on the ice. And and that had to be such an incredible thing to watch those guys go out every night as, as a broadcaster. Yeah, and the way I the way I heard the story, the Arrows decided to go after the first underage junior. Uh, Mark Howe was playing along with his brother Marty Howe for the Toronto Marlboros in the uh, Junior Hockey League in, in Canada, and the NHL had an agreement with uh, junior hockey throughout Canada that they would not sign an underage junior. Of course, the WHA was the uh, Rebel League, so the Arrows went out after uh, Mark Howe decided to uh, go as well after Marty Howe, who would have been eligible for the NHL draft, to entice Mark to sign with the Arrows. As they were finalizing the two contracts for Mark and Marty, Gordy said to Bill Deneen, the coach who took care of uh, player personnel uh, situations for the for the hockey team, Gordy uh, said uh, to Bill Deneen, would you consider even adding a third Howe? And I remember Bill Deneen telling me that his eyes got about as big as saucers, saying, you know, if, you know, if, if Gordy wants to play, you, you, you don't tell Gordy how he's, he's not going to play. But uh, they, they signed Gordy as well, and that's how it all came about. And it, it, was, it was a great story. It was the first time it happened in professional sports. Of course, since then, we've seen Ken Griffey and Ken Griffey Jr. in Major League Baseball perform, as well as Tim Raines and uh, Tim Raines Jr., and there might have, might have been another one or two, but it was it was the Howes who uh, first accomplished that feat. On social media, you shared a story about playing crossword puzzles with Gordy, or, or he was playing crossword puzzles, and you used to sit with him as he did that. Can you share that story? Tell us a little bit more about that. I, I sat next to Gordy a lot because he, he liked to have me help him with his crossword puzzle. We're sitting in the airport in Minneapolis waiting for a flight to continue on a road trip. We were sitting there and working on this puzzle, and this lady walks up to uh, Gordy, who was an elderly lady wearing a cloth coat, and she says, excuse me, Mr. Howe. And she held the lapel of her of her uh, coat up a little bit, and it had a maple leaf pin on it. And she says, I just want to tell you that I'm a, a Canadian. Thank you, and God bless you. And she walked away. And I thought that was one of the most touching moments I've ever seen of appreciation for an athlete and what what he meant to the fans and it was it was a very sweet moment it just showed you the the respect and, and how people felt about Gordie Howe he was such a tough guy on the ice you mentioned he, he he wasn't afraid to give you an elbow he wasn't Wayne Gretzky is a guy that kind of stayed out of the mix but he was a, such a good guy off the ice did you ever see him not be in a good mood with the fans the only time I saw that, and he had every right to do this, after the Arrows won their second championship, they beat the Quebec Nordiques in Quebec City. So we were having a team party in the team hotel after the final game of the series. I was coming back from the restroom, and there was this uh, big uh, gentleman standing in the doorway. And I don't speak French. I don't know what he was saying, but he was yelling at the players and uh, disrupting the party. And Gordy took him by the neck and... Uh, with one hand threw him against the uh, elevator doors, uh, hustling him out of the uh, party where he was not in, uh, invited. But never, no, I never saw Gordy turn down an interview request. I never saw him turn down an autograph. As a matter of fact, there was a game that they were playing, the Arrows were playing in the old arena in Ottawa, where in the first period, Gordy blocked a shot with his foot, broke his foot, left the game in the first period, went to the hospital for x-rays, 
was back for the third period, was standing at the end of the rink watching the action, and people saw that it was Gordie Howe, and they lined up around the circumference of of the rink getting Gordie's autograph, and he stayed there standing on a broken foot signing every autograph. And he signed every autograph. He made it a point to sign every autograph as Gordon Howe, and he did it with such precision, and it was always legible. He never scribbled. He, he even chastised one player, I was told one time in his later years, who uh, hurriedly signed an autograph for a youngster and rushed off. And Gordy said, no, no, you, you owe that fan respect. You sign that autograph where they know who you are. And in this day and age, we've all seen autographs. You, you really can't tell whose name it is. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. And also the, the quality of the WHA, how good were they? How good was that league against the NHL at the time? It was basically the, the equivalent, I guess, of the, the USFL. They were trying to find their way on the map, the USFL or the AFL, and try, trying to get the teams, I would assume, to, to merge into the, into the NHL. Yeah, well, you had Gordie Howe, you had Bobby Hull, Frank Mahovlich, uh, Jerry Cheevers, uh, Derek Sanderson for a while. You had some quality NHL players. Remember, the, the National Hockey League expanded in 1967. They went from the original six teams to 12 teams. So they, they added six teams in 67. The WHA came along in 1972 with 10 teams. There were teams like the Arrows and and Hartford and and, and Winnipeg. And the Winnipeg Jets were the first to start bringing in European players, which uh, now uh, is commonplace in in the National Hockey League. There would have been some competitive teams. I I don't know if they would have been able to stay with uh, the Flyers or Montreal or uh, the Bruins or some of the upper echelon teams of the NHL at that time. But they would have been able to hang with, uh, you know, the Blues and the Kings and, and, and the North Stars and some of the other teams. They would have they would have been, you know, uh, probably middle of the pack to uh, to the towards the bottom, depending on which franchise you're talking about in the WHA. It was really a stroke of luck that Houston ended up with the franchise because the WHA wanted to put them in Dayton to begin with. Right. And that's that's where they started. Right. And, and the gentleman who uh, controlled the arena in Dayton would not give them a lease, would not allow them to play there. So their owner, Paul Deneau, as the story goes, decided to come to Houston and the team got its name, not because of the aerospace industry. But from what I was told, Mr. Deneau getting off the plane was a little bit under the weather. Maybe you had a few too many libations and saw an Aero Mexico plane and decided to call the team the Houston Arrows. Oh, is that right? So nothing to do with the Wright brothers. I think they were from no. that area. No, no. It was, it, I was told it was because he saw the Aero, Aero Mexico plane when he, when he got, off at, uh, got off a plane at Intercontinental Airport. The Arrows, the reason why you ended up in Houston? Or were you already here yeah. at the time? No, no. I, I was a producer at uh, KMOX Radio in, in St. Louis. I didn't know anything about the uh, WHA, really. I, I saw they were starting a new uh, hockey league. And one of our uh, on-air people, Bill Wilkerson, who later was the broadcaster for the football Cardinals when they were in, in St. Louis, said to me, and and, the, and people there knew uh, that I was trying to get on the air somewhere. So I, I think I contacted uh, every minor league hockey team going, and he only got one response, one rejection letter, and nobody else even bothered to, to respond. Bill Wilkerson said, uh, do you know anything about this uh, WHA? He says, I, I got a letter here from their PR director, Lee Mead, telling me about it. And he said, you know, you you ought to contact them. I says, well, you know, they're starting play. They're starting play next week. I said, I don't think there's any chance. But just based on that, out of the blue, I decided to call a friend, Larry Wiggy, over at the Sporting News, who uh, put their book together. As far as everybody knows about the baseball register, which lists all the players and their their stats, they have the hockey register. And uh, Larry Wiggy said to me, yeah, call Lee Mead, the, the PR director, see what he could tell you. So I called Lee Mead. Lee told me, he says, man, I wish you had called yesterday. The uh, Houston franchise is looking for a broadcaster, but they were going to hire somebody today. He says, well, here's the general manager's name, and here's the PR director's name there. Give him a call anyway. So I did. They were both from the Midwest. Jim Smith, the general manager, was from Dayton, Ohio. Sonny Tate, the PR director, was from Cincinnati. And both were very familiar with the KMOX radio, which before ESPN, KMOX radio with Jack Buck, Harry Carey, 
Dan Kelly, the greatest hockey announcer ever lived, Bob Starr, a football broadcaster. Everybody knew about that that station and the quality of the, the broadcasters. And you could pick it up in 42 of the 50 states at night. It was, it was a powerhouse at 1120 on the dial in the Midwest. When I got a hold of Jim Smith, the uh, general manager, since I mentioned I was working at KMOX, he says, well, we were going to hire somebody today. But since you're from KMOX, he says, if you could send us a tape, we'll, we'll hold off and, until we hear your tape. And Dan Kelly used to get me into the back of the press box at the arena in St. Louis to practice doing broadcast there. And, and it was an open press box. There was there was no particular booth there. You just sat at, at a table and you had people shoulder to shoulder. So I'm sure I drove a lot of people crazy in those days with my with my attempting to be a broadcaster. Well, as luck would have it, I, I, I sent them a tape. I had not heard from the Arrows for a, a couple of days. And then it turned out on a Monday night, well, we used to watch The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. That was back in the day when, when Carson was still working on Monday nights. I watched his monologue and decided to get up and go to bed. And and that was about 10.45 in the evening. As I'm walking by, the only phone we had, which was on the kitchen wall, the phone rang. And it was Sonny Tate, their PR director, asking if I could be in uh, Houston the next day for an interview. And uh, I was supposed to uh, work at KMOX the next day. Well, I had my wife call in sick. I took my first airplane ride, went down to Houston, spent the entire day w- with the Arrows, didn't didn't really speak to uh, the general manager or the PR director. They were so busy doing other things. They sat around the office all day. They took me to dinner that night. We talked a little bit. They asked me to stay over the next day. I, and I didn't have, because they told me I'd be in and out on that Tuesday. Like I said, my first airplane flight, I didn't pack a toothbrush. I didn't pack a change of clothes. I had no suitcase. They asked me to stay over. I, I said, sure. And I went back the next day, and they offered me the job. Flew back to St. Louis, kissed my wife goodbye. Flew back to uh, Houston the day before the season started. Didn't meet any of the players. Got the lineup and started doing broadcasts. And then right after the Arrows closed out and the WHA was gone, you, you stick around in Houston. You were working for the Rockets at that point for a couple of years, right? You you worked the games with Calvin Murphy was there at the time and Rudy T. Yeah, they were players. I worked with the late Ken Heinemann uh, doing the television for a couple of years. I, I guess we were told that we weren't homers enough for them. So even though the ratings were high, they let us go up to two years. But by that time, I was sports director at at KTRH in Houston and started a talk show and started doing some other things and, and got involved in college football and basketball and eventually got with the Astros and, and, and the Oilers broadcast and then then had opportunities elsewhere, which took me away. But we certainly miss Houston, would would have loved to have been back there had, had things worked out with the Astros, but they didn't. You know, some of our best memories, our two sons were born down there and and they consider themselves Texans. Texans, as a matter of fact, our one son is getting married in September, and uh, the, the boys are big Texas Longhorn fans. The one son that's getting married is getting everybody, including the two fathers of the participants, the bride and the groom, and everybody in the uh, wedding party on the male side will be wearing Texas Longhorn stockings. <laughs> Well, do you have any memories of of Rudy T or a story of Rudy T or Calvin Murphy since you got to to call those games? Yeah, and I'm going to blame this on the hockey players because, I mean, they were a great bunch of guys, and they're still friends, and I still keep in contact with with a bunch of them. But they taught me some bad habits like how how to play practical jokes on people. (laughs) So, So we're doing a game one night in Denver. Calvin Murphy gets called for a foul just before we go into our TV timeout. And Daryl Gerritsen was the official. Daryl used to always like to come over if he was working a game while we were working and talk to us over his shoulder during the commercial break. So so Murphy's hot about the call that's against him. He's called to the huddle after, after saying a few things to Daryl Gerritsen. And Gerritsen leans over his shoulder and says to me, he says, uh, what, what did the replay show? What did you think of the call? I said, Daryl, great call. You got it right. You got it right. So now it's time. He blows the whistle. It's time to get back into the play. And Murphy, Murphy comes by and says, what did the replay show? I says, oh, he missed the call. You you didn't follow that guy. I don't know why he called that on you. So he goes charging after Daryl Garrettson, and he's going to get a technical, but Rudy T grabs him and, and keeps him from um, getting kicked out of the game. So that's the last time I, I pulled anything like that. <laughs> 
Well, it's great to talk to you about Gordy Howe. And it's amazing that, you know, Houston got a chance to watch him play for a few years. And it's amazing because we still don't have a hockey team here. We, we had a minor league team for a while, the, the Houston Arrows minor league team. But Houston still doesn't have a hockey team. So it's just a, it's incredible that we had a chance to get to see Gordy Howe play right here in Houston. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, the fans still remember him fondly. But to me, Houston is a major league city. And they should have an NHL team. I think they would support an NHL team without any question. I think it would do very well there. But from what I hear, there's some political things behind the scene that's that's preventing them getting dates uh, at the uh, what is it, the Toyota Center now, the uh, arena there. And, and there are people who, you know, they're, they're protecting the Rockets, which is, I guess, they're right. But you'd, you'd love to see the fans have that uh, ability to see the nhl in person there well thank you so much for taking the time to, to do this i always love talking to you jerry thanks so much Any, anytime robert representing all of hockey with great distinction for five decades number nine how over the line to his father son to father back in that's the way i felt i've always felt that way that the um the people have shown their love for me and the, and the only way you can repay it is to go and give 100 percent that's there's no game I ever come off the ice with uh, with the total knowledge that's the best I had. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Don't forget to follow Houston Sports Talk on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Podcast app, or the Stitcher app. You can support us by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or by telling your friends about us Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.